I was thinking as we singing that song, His Goodness is Running After Me, I told the story about uh, three or four weeks ago. Um, I was leaving a service and I was going home and I got uh, through town and I got a phone call from Cheryl. And Cheryl said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm headed home. She said, yeah, I saw you headed through. Said, uh, would you pull over and stop? And I said, well, where are you? She said, well, I'm behind you just a little while. Pull over and stop. I have something for you. And I said, what do you have for me? She said, I have some fried pies, uh, apricot and peach. So I immediately pulled over. And I thought about this verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I thought, let me tell you, I'll pull over for fried pies any day. Stand with me tonight. I want to I want to speak to you about a faith that moves us, and certainly we don't want to have a faith that stays in the same place. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, so Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace that we heard about this morning. Thank you for your care for us, your love for us, and the opportunities you have for us. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here today. I want to make a statement here, and hopefully you'll get it. What seemed impossible to us yesterday, and even today, will seem normal tomorrow and in the future. I remember my great-grandmother, Martha Jane. We just called her Grandma. And she would uh, tell me stories about coming from Texas to Oklahoma and crossing the Red River in a covered wagon. Uh, How many of you know those days are far behind? And I also remember that her and my great aunts, when in the, what was 1969, when we went to the moon, they had a hard time believing that we actually went to the moon. Does anybody have any relatives like that that just absolutely did not believe that we went to the moon? But today our world has completely changed. And I want to give you just a couple of cases in point because sometimes if you don't think that you can move past where you are or we can achieve things that seemingly is unachievable, you will stay landlocked spiritually where you currently are. So I want to increase our faith tonight to believe things that maybe we hadn't believed before in the sense that we can attain them and reach out and grab them by faith. I don't know if you've seen the news lately that Tom Brady... Uh, has come out of retirement. He stayed in retirement, what? Less than 30 days, I think. So 30, 40 days, I don't know what it is. But Tom Brady is an amazing guy. He's 44 years old, plays the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He has won seven Super Bowls. He has won more Super Bowls individually, personally, than franchises collectively across the, the years. He, he has so many records. He has... Uh, the seven Super Bowl wins. Five times he has been the most valuable player in the Super Bowl. He has the most career wins as a quarterback, the most passing completions. He has the most passing touchdowns, the most passing yards. And it seems seems almost inconceivable that anyone could come behind him and break all those records. But this has been thematic across history. Many of you know the story of Roger Bannister. For years, no one had run a four-minute mile or less. And, and people had tried. I mean, for decades, they tried to break that four-minute mile record. So in 1945, the record was four minutes, 1.3 seconds, set by Gunder Haig of Sweden. And for 10 years, people tried to break that record. Uh, so, you know, here, here he comes along, Bannister, and he breaks that record, and he runs in 1954, three minutes, 59 seconds, point four. so it's just right into the four. I mean, this went worldwide. A runner actually broke the four-minute mile record, and some people said it's physically impossible for a person to run a mile less than four minutes. I mean, they're saying your body just can't do that. So... 
in just 46 days after that, John Landy from Australia broke Bannister's record. A year later, three runners broke the record in the same race. Today, the record for the mile is 3.43.13 seconds. The women's record is 4.12 seconds. The record for high school boys is 3.53 seconds six seconds faster than Bannister's record in 1954. Now, we're talking about high school. So what I'm saying is if we don't watch it, we'll get into this mentality that, okay, this is fast as we can go, this is far as we can go, this is how much we can achieve, and we have to look at just the natural things really to show a spiritual application. Lou Gehrig of the New York Yankees, he was called the Iron Man. He set the record for the most consecutive Major League Baseball wins, 2,130. The record stands for 56 years, and they said nobody can break that record. Cal Ripon Jr. came along, Baltimore Orioles, he breaks that record, and he surpasses that record by 502 games, and Garrick had the record by almost 1,000 games before the guy before him who held the record. So th this just seems like you know nobody can get past this. Ty Cobb, he had the most hits, 4,189 hits. Then Pete Rose comes along, 4,256 uh, hits in the Major League Baseball. Now, th this is a little area here that I'm kind of excited about. My favorite Tarzan of all time, Johnny Weissmuller. I mean, he had the quintessential Tarzan yell. Now, this is how he came to fame. In 1924, he ha held many records for swimming. That's how he was cast for Tarzan. And so in Paris, he broke records. So this guy um, it is amazing. He set 67 world records in swimming. And they held most of them till the 1970s. However, today... Women and girls ages 12, 13, and 16, <laughs> 12, 13, and 16 have broken most of his gold medal records up until this time. So don't think that, okay, this is as far as we can go. This is as far as, you know, you can achieve. Uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, first man that we know of who climbed Mount Everest, Everest actually on my birthday, 529.53. And they thought it was impossible maybe to reach the top. Uh, even today, there have been days that 37 people on the same day climb Mount Everest. Now, I know better equipment, you know, more technology, so it's a little bit easier. So the point being, we get into this mentality, this is, this is the, the top, this, this far as we can go. We, we can think about that individually, we can think about it in our business. We can even think about that in our church, in our church. You can think that even with your own life. Okay, I've kind of reached this, and I don't think I'm going to get past this barrier, but I want to change your mind tonight to let you know from the Word of God it's, it's possible to do the impossible with God. Let me say that again. It's possible to do the impossible with God. So let's go back to where we started, Matthew chapter 17. Here, here's, the, here, here's the setting, verse 20. A man who has an epileptic son has brought him to Jesus' disciples. They've asked for help because they've heard about the miracle working power of Jesus. They've tried to administer prayer, the power of God for this son to no avail. Then the man brings the son to Jesus and says this, I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't help. And then Jesus, he heals the son, cast out that spirit. And that's when he said, if you could only have faith like what? Just a grain of mustard seed, you would be amazed at what you can do. Can I hear an amen? So somebody had to believe for that young man's condition to be changed. And when that condition was changed, I mean, you know, he was never the same again. So when we have faith and we believe the Word of God and we walk in the Word of God, our lives will be in a supernatural setting and environment and atmosphere and we can do things that we thought we could never do or achieve things we could never achieve. Now this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. 
If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now that's the Lord saying if we draw back, he has no pleasure in us. Now notice the words here, draw back. Say that with me. Here we go. Draw back. Now let's all say it together. Draw back. So here is the negative in the scripture. So a faithless life, a fearful life that doesn't move forward but tends to go back is not going to please the Lord. But if we live in fear and if we live faithless, then we have the tendency, what, to draw back. Sometimes we think, well, I'm stalemated and I'm just here. No, usually you don't stay here. You start sliding backwards. You don't stay at the same place. So we don't want to be faithless. We don't want to be fearful because that causes us to go in reverse and not move forward. So I want to give you tonight just four things. If you have a pencil, paper, jot it down. I think it's going to be noteworthy. Uh, I'm not going to hold you long. Uh, famous words of Elizabeth Taylor when she got married, I won't keep you long. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to hold you long here, but, but I think it's important that we, we get this. Faith is the eye that sees into the unseen. Faith is the eye that sees into the unseen. Many of you know, I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, there's an unseen spiritual world that carnality cannot see. The spiritual world that we know of was here before the physical world was ever created. Everything that we know in the physical world was a product of the spiritual world. In the beginning, God. So God is a spirit, John 4, 24. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God spoke the word and things began to come into being. So the, the physical world is a product of the unseen spiritual world. We get a glimpse of that by faith through the Holy Spirit, then we can begin to see a little bit of that spiritual world. Now, we don't see all of it. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but I'll guarantee you we can get a glimpse of that spiritual world as we see it through the eyes of faith. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Now, when he says not seen, he's talking about that, that physicality. We can't see it with the natural eye. But with the eye of faith, how many of you know you can see more than you think you can see? which allows you to go further than you think you can go and accomplish more things than you think you can accomplish. I remember when we, we began to build this camp, camp, campus up here, I've said it many times, you don't know how many consolation <laughs> words I got about us making this move. Oh, I tell you what, y'all are fixing to make a big mistake. You're going to build that. It's going to cost you millions of dollars. Uh, people aren't going to come out in the middle of a cow pasture. I mean, it's not in town. How many of you know God has the final word? And, and now we're looking to even expand and, and to, to grow even further because the eye of faith sees into the unseen realm. So our eyes focus on not just where we are or where we have been, our eyes can focus in front of us to where we're headed. That's why God didn't put eyes to the back of your head. He wants you to what? See forward. Now, we've always said this about our mothers. Our mothers have eyes in the back of their head because they can see things and know things that we don't know how they know. Uh, I'll tell you a story. Um, when I was a senior in high school, uh, the last... Um, the busting I got in school was about four weeks before I graduated as a senior. Just saying. And so one uh, day in high school, we all went to lunch, and so some of us thought, well, you know, we're at lunch. I don't want to finish out the rest of the day. So I, I went with a friend over to his house, and we were just skipping school. And I'm at his house. And I'm thinking nobody knows that we're gone. We, we, we left for lunch. We just never did come back. His phone rings in his home. I remember when there used to be landlines in your house. So his phone rings in his house, and he hands it to me, and he said, it's for you. <laughs> and I'm thinking, for me? I'm not even in my house. Nobody knows I'm here. And it was my mother. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing there and I, uh, 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 uh. well, my mother was a school teacher, and somebody ratted me out, 
And so, anyway, I got in trouble for skipping school. Now, I, I've never figured this out. So here's the punishment for skipping school. You can't come to school the next day. <laughs> Go figure. But we, we, we don't always have eyes in the back of our head. We have eyes in front of us because God wants us to do what? He wants us to go forward and not draw back. He said, if we draw back, he said, my soul has no pleasure in you if you back up. So there is a spiritual realm that we tap into that we move forward. It's the eye of faith that sees the unseen, Hebrews 11 and 1, the things that we see that are unseen. Now, I want to give you a couple of accounts that they tie together. This is out of uh, the, the book of 2 Kings. It's when Elijah passes on, if you remember, his mantle to the next prophet, who is Elisha. And now Elisha has taken the, the realm of the prophetic voice of Israel. And we know Elijah went up to heaven. And now there's this conflict between Israel and the Syrians. And every time they would attack Israel, Israel would know where they're going to attack and meet them at the border to repel the attack. So they, they would say, okay, we're going to attack again at a different location. Israel would be there again. The Israeli army would show up again. And so they're saying, how in the world do they know where we're going to attack? There must be a spy among us. And of course, it wasn't a spy. The Lord would reveal to Elisha the prophet where they were going to attack, he would tell the king and the army, and they would go repel the Syrians. And finally, someone figured it out, and in, you know, in the meeting, uh, listen, king, this is what's happening. God is revealing this to the prophet. He's telling the Israeli army, that's why we're getting beaten. They know where we're coming before we get there. How many of you know God knows? So what they do, they find out where he is staying, they sent the drone out or whatever they sent out, I don't know how, but they find where he's staying. It's in a little city called Dothan, D-O-T-H-A-N. And so they have one objective in mind, and that's to surround the city and take out Elisha, the prophet of God. So his servant goes out that day, and when he goes out, you know the story, he sees the Syrian army that has surrounded that little city for one guy by the name of Elisha, he goes back in, he tells his master, Elisha, boss, it's not going to be a good day. He says the whole Syrian army is out there and has us surrounded. So now Elisha goes out and he surveys the situation, but he sees something the servant doesn't see. He sees something the servant doesn't see. What he sees is the army of God, the chariots of God, has the Syrian army surrounded. Yes. And we sing this song, uh, that, that has me surrounded, you've got it surrounded. Remember the song we sing? And, and so he says, Lord, open up my servant's eyes that he can see. And when he opened up his eyes, then he could see God had the enemy surrounded and it was gonna be okay. So when we see with eyes of faith, we see things that other people can't see, we experience things other people can't experience because of this faith that moves us forward. And if we don't have it, we don't see it. We feel stalemated. We kind of sink down in our posture of defense instead of moving forward. And let me tell you, we need to keep moving forward. Can I hear an amen? So here's the second thing. Faith is the heart that responds to the word of God. You say, why, why do we have to have a heart that responds to the word of God? Because sometimes the mind doesn't always respond to the word of God because it makes no sense to the mind. Let me say that again. Sometimes it makes no sense to our carnal mind. We have to have a heart of faith to move the direction God's leading us. That's why Paul said we have to renew our mind. We have to be transformed to know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So we have to have a heart that responds to faith and not just a carnal mind that figures this out because sometimes it makes no earthly sense, right? So we have to, we have to respond by our heart. Romans 10.10, 10, for with the heart, man believes. Would you say that with me? For with the heart, man believes. So th this is a heart issue. Yeah. 
It can't always be just a carnal mind thing. It is a heart issue. God deals with our heart. So let, let's take the same guy, Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 13. This is verse 14 through 19. Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So remember, let's stop right there. Who is giving them the information to keep the Syrians from attacking them and defeating them? It is this guy, Elisha. And Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, open the east window. And he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and he stopped. And the man of God was very angry with him and he said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you have destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Do you know if he had obeyed what he should have obeyed and done what he should have done, there would not have been a Syrian problem? Okay, let me say that again. There would not have been a Syrian problem because God had already given the answer, but what we have here is a half-hearted effort to the solution. God gave the opportunity to destroy their enemies but a half-hearted effort failed to achieve total victory. Now, remember, we, we believe with our heart by faith. We have to be believers. And so if we have a half-hearted heart in response to what God is saying to us by his word, then we don't get the results we want. So we have to go in this full tilt. We, we have to say, listen, I'm committed. I, I, I've given my whole heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Carrie and I, with our son many years ago, uh, we went to a counseling session, and I remember the counselor, it was a, a lady, she was a nice lady, I you know, didn't know her, have nothing against her, but I remember to this day, she was asking us some questions, of course, personal questions, and she said, so are y'all believers, are, are you Christians? And we said, yes. And she said, well, I, I hear you're a pastor, and I said, yes. And this was the question uh, that she asked, she said, well, how committed are you to that? And that was the question. And I guess maybe it's a good question. Well, how committed are you to that? And I remember looking at her just eye to eye, and in, in that conversation, she said, how serious are you? And I looked at her and I said, dead serious. Dead serious. And she had to regain her composure a little bit till she responded back because I said it, I mean, I thought, you know, how, how committed are you? How serious are you? And I said, dead serious. And she kind of paused, then we went on with the, uh, the, the, the session. But you know what? We got to be dead serious about this, don't we? Because one day you're going to be dead and this will be serious. Okay? Because when you're dead, this is serious. Because if you haven't given your heart to Jesus Christ, you're in serious trouble. And so faith is not only just a life that we live and we're not going through emotions, uh, 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 emotions, but we have to have a heart for this and give our heart to him for this to work out. Can I hear an amen? So here's the third thing about faith that moves us forward. Faith is the hand that receives the gifts of God to pursue the goals of God. So we, re we receive the gifts of God to pursue the goals of God. Now this is John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power and the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So if we're believers, listen to this, if we receive him, if we believe him, then he gives us the power and the right to become what? The children of God. Of God. So if we receive him, the him is Jesus, then we are now the children of God. And as children, how many of you know there are benefits to being children? Yeah. Yeah. 
and uh, I'm kind of a new grandfather, there's even more benefits to being grandchildren. You, you know, uh, when, when you're uh, children, parents have certain rules and regulations. When you're grandchildren, all stops are out. We, we have ice cream and popsicles at Papa's house. And I remember, and I shared this with you, the first time I gave Riley her first popsicle. She never had a popsicle before. I mean, that's child abuse. <laughs> but at Papa's house, I gave her a popsicle, and I remember I said, uh, Riley, how, how do you like that popsicle? She said, Papa, I like it. <laughs> so... As children, we have benefits. So I want you to look at the benefits we have. As children of God, we, we receive the power of God. We receive the gifts of God. We receive the armor of God. And we also have the agenda of God. So the power of God is the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So as believers, of course, you know, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that, that did not stop with the apostles. To you, your children, and all those that what are far off. So we still believe today in the power of the Holy Spirit. So as children, guess what? The Spirit comes to us. It is, it is the gift of the Father. This is what Jesus said in, in Acts chapter 1. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many know it's a gift? So the power of God... The gifts of God, we still believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can find those in 1 Corinthians 12. You can find those in Romans 12. So those gifts are still available to the children of God today. God still gives gifts by the Holy Spirit. The armor of God, which is what we dress up spiritually in to fight the, the warfare, the battles. And most of you know, he did not give us armor on the back side, only the front side. So that's why he says you don't draw back because you have no armor on the back side. You keep facing forward. And that's why I'm saying we need a faith that moves us what? Forward. We have to have a faith that moves us forward. I've said this, I don't know how many times here. I'm not interested in being a church on the corner for a hundred years that's just surviving. I'm looking to go forward Amen. and reaching our world. As Randy said, you know, we just gave tens of thousands of dollars to the aid for Ukraine. Uh, this church right here, you were instrumental. And as Mary shared the, the text from the Czech Republic and what's happening there in Poland, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, all those countries that are right around the Ukraine, we, we have now, what, close to 3 million-plus refugees that have left the Ukraine going into Eastern Europe. And now, what do you do with them? Where do they go? Where do they eat? Where do, where do they stay? And so now, uh, Stanislav Church, I think, now has just almost doubled. Doubled because of this influx of people that are coming in. And, and I want you to know, you know, more mouths to feed more people to help, places for them to stay, places for them to sleep. I mean, some of them left, and you know this from Ukraine, with only the things they could carry. And they had to leave everything else behind. And so we're not just looking forward to what we can do here. We're looking forward to what we can do, not only locally, but globally. And we're able to do that. Why? Because we believe. We have a faith that's moving forward and not stagnant and staying in one place. So we have to realize that we receive the gifts of God by faith. And if we receive the gifts of God, then let me tell you what comes attached to that, the goals of God. So it's not my agenda anymore. Yeah. It's not your agenda anymore. So it is the power of God, the gifts of God, the armor of God, the agenda of God. And even Jesus prayed this, not my will be done, but Thy will be done. So we have to be in a place to say, this is not my agenda. This is God's agenda. And the only way I can really embrace that is by faith, because I have to walk in that by faith every day. Can I hear an amen to that? Now here's the last thing. It takes faith to get us out of something, and it takes faith to get us into something. You know, Pastor Matt mentioned it this morning. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've all done wrong. 
for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And so no, no matter where you're at in, in this Christian walk, you came out of sin. Sure. You had no other choice, for we are all sinners. And, you know, we didn't say Paul came from the south and say y'all are sinners. He said we're all sinners. So we had to come out of sin, and the only way you could come out of sin, you had to believe in Jesus Christ. You, you can't come out on your own. You're not strong enough, moral enough. Uh, you, you, you're, you're not rich enough. You're not anything enough. The only way we're saved is by Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. So I had to believe to get out of sin. It took faith to get out of sin. It takes faith to get out of addiction. It, it, it takes faith to move your marriage forward. It takes faith to move you forward. It takes faith to move me forward. I have to have faith to move forward. But it also takes faith not to just to get out of something. It takes faith to get into something. Faith to get out of it. Faith to get into it. So what I come out of, I leave behind. What I go into, I reach out by faith to take in and move me and propel me to where God is leading me. So let me just take a couple of illustrations very quickly. Moses goes to Egypt faces Pharaoh because God has a, an agenda for Moses. He has a goal for the people of Israel, the Hebrews. Now you, you know that Moses had some moments <laughs> in his call where he didn't really realize he could do what God called him to do. So remember, to receive the things God has for us, it takes faith, right? Right? And sometimes that faith wavers, and Moses did, and he says, God, you know, they're not going to believe me. I can't talk very well. I got all these issues, and God had to walk him through that. Has God ever had to walk you through some stuff? And God leading you, and you thought, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Mary and I were talking before service. She said 45 years ago she was baptized, and I was baptized uh, about a couple of months before she was in January, and uh, we were all in college together, and let me tell you, over 45 years ago, if you told me today I would be standing here doing what I'm doing, I would say, me no think so. <laughs> but it took faith to get me out of sin, and it takes faith to get me where God wanted me to go. And that faith is still present today to get me where God's still leading me and where he's still leading you. So I want you to think about that. So Moses has to get through some excuses he has to get through some past failures. I don't even know he killed an Egyptian, tried to bury him in the sand, and, and it came to light. So God is saying, now Moses, I want you to go back and deliver my people out of the bondage of Egypt. So think about this. This is kind of humorous. He shows up to one of the greatest dynasties the world has ever known with a stick. Okay. You tracking with me? He shows up with a stick with the rod of God. Now, what happens is Moses' rod now becomes the rod of God, and it's actually referred to as the rod of God. So sometimes what you have that you think is not important, God takes it to a whole nother level. So here you are. You, you, you are in front of the most powerful guy in the known world there at that juncture and he has armies and chariots, and I mean, he's got all kind of stuff, and you show up with a stick. How many you know that took some faith? And then the plagues begin to happen. And th there's supernatural events that begin to happen. And so confronting the Egyptian dynasty to get out of that bondage took faith. It took faith to take the Passover lamb and to strike the blood around your door, your lintel, the, the side post, because no one had ever experienced that before. So when the word came out, if you don't apply the blood, there's going to come death to your house. So you had to believe what was said. And if you didn't believe what was said, death entered your house, whether you were an Egyptian or a Hebrew. It made no difference. So they had to walk by faith to get out of that bondage. But then 
they had to have not only faith to get out, they had to have faith to go out because there was faith for the exodus, supernatural deliverance. We have the, the plagues. You, you, you come up against the Red Sea. And Pharaoh's pressing in, and it looks like everything's over. You're not going to get out of this. Uh, you, you have the sea on one side. You're bound by the mountains on the other side. He's coming up the, the valley with the, the chariots and the armies of Egypt, and everybody thinks they're goners. And then God says, Moses, quit crying to me. Stretch forth the stick. Well, not the stick, but stretch forth the rod. And we know the east wind began to blow, and The waters parted, and not only did they go across, but the Bible says they crossed on dry ground. Dry ground. Because if it's muddy, sometimes you can slip up. But God said dry ground. And the wonderment of all this is when Pharaoh and his armies tried to follow, God closed the water over them. Aren't you glad your past can't follow you to the other side? Well, that'll preach, won't it? Anybody got anything that wanted to follow you through as you left bondage? Do you have any issues that wanted to follow you through? (laughs) All of us do. And we have to go through the waters and God closes that up. And he said, the armies you see today, he said, you will see no more. They're going to be gone. And I don't know if you've studied this or looked at any of this, but uh, do you know in the Red Sea that they have found parts of chariots at the bottom of that sea. Wonder where they came from. I got a sneaky feeling. Don't you? So, so there, there has to be faith to Exodus. There has to be faith in the journey because they needed supernatural water, water out of the rock. They had to have supernatural food, manna fall from heaven, the quail to blow in on the wind. They had to have a supernatural provision for 40 years but then they came to the place where God led them and that's Canaan the land that flows with milk and honey but can I tell you that when they got there it wasn't what they thought they thought okay you know God's helped us to get out he's helped us to get through and now we're going to enter in and they find the river Jordan flooded the first city they see on the other side is what the city of Jericho that looks like it can't be defeated. Let me just say this, and I want you to think about this. The enemy will try to keep you out from what God wants you to go into. The enemy will try to keep you out of what God wants you to go into. Now, how in the world do we go into what the enemy wants to keep us out of? It's by faith. It's by faith. So when the Lord spoke to Joshua and he said this, This is what you do. You can't cross the river, but as God parted the Red Sea for Moses, guess what he's going to do? He's going to part the river. Matter of fact, it's kind of a different parting. He caused the water to wall up on one side. He literally stopped the flow of the river and let them cross over. Now, it was a little different. He didn't have the rod, but he took the Ark of the Covenant with the priest and they walked out into the water and at some point, I don't know where it was, but at some point when they got into the water, the water stopped and they crossed over to Canaan. But then once they cross over, then you have this almost impregnable city that you you can't defeat. And then God says, okay, you know, I, I stopped the water of the river, got you here. And sometimes we think, okay, God, you got me this far, but what do I do now? I got, I got another obstacle, got another situation, got another problem. Does anybody find you got another problem after the last problem? Y'all are so holy. I mean, yeah, I got this one taken care of. Now I've got to, you know, take care of the next one. And then the Lord speaks to Joshua and he says, okay, I'm going to give you the city, but this is the way you do it. When, <laughs> when Joshua heard that plan... I think he had to have a lot of faith. What do you think? Okay, you want us to do what? I want you to march around the city. March around it. Next day, march around it. Next day, march around it. 
When do we attack? You don't attack. You know, uh, okay. Just march around. But on that last day, you know, I want you to do something different than you did the other days. Because the other days, I want you to march around and no one says a word. And, and I always say this because I think it's important. No one say a word as you're marching around the city. Why did God say this? Because if we were allowed to talk, this is what we would have said. Daryl and I would have been together. We'd march around the city and I'd say, Daryl, this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. <laughs> is this really what God said? Yeah. Joshua must be out of his ever-loving mind, Daryl. We've been marching around this thing one day, two days, three days, four days, and nothing's happening. But on that seventh day when they marched, and the, they blew the trumpets and they shouted. The walls came down and, and the walls fell out to give them a ramp to go in. So what did it take? It took faith to believe what God said. Now, let me stop here and conclude this. We need a faith that causes us to move forward. Now, I know we need faith to stand. We've we got to have faith to have that foundation w within us and under us. We have to have faith to stand in the day of adversity. I get it. But we also have to have faith to go forward. Because if you don't have that faith to go forward, what you'll find is you'll stalemate or stagnate somewhere around that time when you don't move forward and this is what he said, you will start drawing back. And my soul has no pleasure in those who, what, draw back. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we need to have that kind of faith. Because sometimes, you know, you hear this, well, pastor, why, why do we keep pushing? Why do we keep pressing? Why do we keep trying to grow? Why do we, why do we keep building? Because I don't want to not be moving forward and I don't want you not to be moving forward and sometimes it's it's tough sometimes you know it's it's hard work but God has the kind of faith that he wants us to break embrace that we just keep moving forward and I believe every one of us can do that right stand with me tonight